Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, Shannon, thank you for inviting me. Um, I used to spend a lot of time in this building back in the day. Uh, and, and, and sadly, I, I only seem to get here these days when someone's retiring. Uh, Debbie Dietrich's retirement was a, the most recent visit, uh, and I should really uh, always intend to correct that, and somehow haven't. Uh, but it's, it's great to be here today and, uh, and to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, um, you know, present this paper and kind of, you know, I think Paul might be the only uh, professor still here from the days when I was a grad student. Uh, uh, if David's around, uh, David, David was there at the end of my grad student days. Uh, but most have retired, and like I said, that's you know, been the cause of many of my visits, uh, has been the retirement receptions. Um, but yeah, so I want to talk, uh, present this paper. I'm going to read this paper, um, which uh, I've been, as, as Shannon mentioned, I've been doing work on love and personal identity uh, and kind of trying to approach it from diff some different angles. Uh, and this paper just sort of, um, I don't know, came together as I was reading Parfit. And uh, there's a short section of Parfit uh, uh, where he talks about love um, that I sort of focus on and sort of becomes the sort of you know, uh, starting off point for what I want to talk about. <clears throat> In the short section of Reasons and Persons called am I, am I a Token or a Type, Derek Parfit discusses the issue of love. Admittedly, he was not intending to present, present a theory of love, uh, but his view of love and the relation between it and his notion of personal identity raises some important questions. Parfit believed that his view of personal identity is not only compatible with, but supports, quote, the best conception of the best kind of love. Uh, Parfit's interest in the topic of love here arises from a more primary concern, which has to do with the metaphysics of personal identity. His conception of love can reasonably be seen as influenced by his view of personal identity. Alan Sobel has explored the relation between love and personal identity in the opposite direction and more indirectly. Sobel is fundamentally concerned with love, or more precisely, the structure of love, including love's object. Uh, but his view of love is most compatible with, and perhaps even suggests a specific view of personal identity uh, that constitutes love's object. Uh, the aim of this paper is to explore the relation between love and personal identity, I, I believe that the relation between these two concepts has been underexplored, a point that Christopher Gao uh, makes in his uh, um, article called, uh, called Love and History. Uh, perhaps one of the reasons for this neglect is that the relation between these two notions gives rise to a certain ambiguity regarding love's object. On the one hand, exploring love's object in the context of the metaphysics of personal identity, as Parfit and Bernard Williams do, uh, focuses on the nature of some entity in the world independent of any relationship to that entity. We see this clearly in the case of Parfit, where his theory of personal identity has a kind of priority over his view of human relationships, not only when it comes to love, but ethics as well. <clears throat> On the other hand, uh, sorry, uh, for my purposes, it's important to note that, the, uh, that his view of personal identity gives rise to, or at least supports, a particular kind of conception of love. On the other hand, the idea of love's object can be seen from the perspective of a view of love, as is the case with Sobel's work. Here we are concerned more with the structure and phenomenology of love, and perhaps with what can be called love's intentional focus. For instance, when we love someone, is our love aimed at the properties of the beloved or at something else, whether this be a self or immaterial soul or, or what have you? Um, these two conceptions of love's object raise fundamentally different questions, and yet it seems to me that they are importantly related. As Grau says in the aforementioned article, a conception of love for persons is unlikely to float free of a conception of the nature of persons. So I want to examine this, relation, uh, this relationship in both directions uh, as exemplified by the work particularly of Parfit and Sobel. More specifically, I'm interested in exploring the relation uh, between one's view of love and a phenomenology of love on the one hand and one's view of personal identity on the other. As suggested above, the projects of Parfit and Sobel are quite different in their aims. In one sense, they're both concerned in part, at least, with identifying the object of love. Uh, but what is meant by this expression is not the same for both thinkers. For Parfit, the object of love is to be understood in terms of his view of personal identity, and it is his view of personal identity that influences his view of love. For Sobel, the object of love is understood more in terms of, of his theory of love. Um, which hints at a view of personal identity. 
Although a theory of love and a phenomenology of love may exist independently of a metaphysical view of personal identity, I'm interested in exploring the region where they overlap with the hope of discovering something interesting about their relation. I'll proceed by sketching my own view of the relation between love's object and personal identity before comparing it with that of uh, Parfit and Sobel. My paper's a little backwards that way. I start with my own view and then, uh, then go back to the other views. Uh, I'll specifically de develop my own view in, uh, by way of contrast with David Velleman's account of love. Uh, my hope here is to show the plausibility of my own view as well as to highlight certain problems in the treatment of this issue by the aforementioned thinkers. I believe that the object of personal love is another embodied human being. It may sound obvious to suggest this, but the point is obscured by the approaches of both Parfit and Sobel. Parfit identifies the mental life of the beloved, Parfit, sorry, Parfit identifies the mental life of the beloved as the primary focus of love, and his thought experiments separate the mental aspect of the person uh, from the person's body, relegating the latter to a position of lower importance. Sobel does not prioritize the mental life, but rather describes love's object as a collection of properties both bodily and mental, uh, that constitute the beloved. The character, this characterization of love's object strikes me, strikes me as abstract. Uh, Sobel suggests that in making sense of love, we can view love's ground in terms of the value of the beloved's po positive properties versus that of her negative qualities. I believe that such a characterization fails to capture the sense in which a person's properties are embodied properties. And embodied properties can only be adequately understood by viewing the person as a unified whole. Uh, so the first section where I present my own view is called the embodied person as the object of love. <clears throat> what is it exactly that we love when we say that we love another person? Is it a self, a soul, a personality? The Platonic Christian tradition, which has dominated much of Western thinking on this issue, has generally opted for something like a mental or spiritual core uh, in opposition to a visible body. One contemporary philosopher who gives a provocative take on this issue is Velleman. In his essay, Love as a Moral Emotion, he presents us with his Kantian influenced view of love and love's object. I find Velleman's account to be very interesting and will discuss it with the aim of presenting my own view in, by way of contrast. In the aforementioned article, Velleman, like Sobel, aims at giving account, an account of love rather than a, than a discussion of personal identity. Unlike Sobel, however, Velleman is not really giving an account of love's object, or at least not directly. But the latter's view implies a particular notion of the object of personal love. Velleman tells us, and to quote Velleman here, I find it intuitively plausible that we love people for their true and better selves. The for here suggests that Velleman is talking about the basis or ground of love rather than love's object. The basis object distinction is one that Sobel makes in the structure of love. For Sobel, the basis of love is that by virtue of which one loves the beloved. The object of love, on the other hand, is the person whom one loves. Sobel employs this distinction in order to address a misunderstanding associated with the question of love's object. <clears throat> what does Velleman mean when he says that we love people for their true or better selves? His answer appears in the following passage, and again, to quote from Velleman, but when, our, when the object of our love is a person, and we, when we love him as a person, rather than as a work of nature, say, or an aesthetic object, then indeed I want to say we are responding to the value that he possesses by virtue of being a person, or as Kant would say, an instance of a rational nature. Again, to put this in terms of Sobel's distinction, this passage is primarily concerned with the basis of love rather than love's object. Instead of love being grounded in properties, in properties as in Sobel's view, um, Velleman sees love as based on the value attached to personhood, uh, personhood in the Kantian sense. <clears throat> even though his primary concern in this passage has to do with the basis, and perhaps even the nature of love, he also indicates that the object of this kind of love is a person. Personhood here is to be understood in terms of being an instance of a rational nature. Velleman makes it clear that this is not simply to be equated with a person's intellect. Again, uh, to quote from Velleman, uh, but rational nature is not the intellect, not even the practical intellect. It's a capacity of appreciation or valuation, a capacity to care about things in that reflective way which is distinctive of self-conscious creatures like us. Think of a person's rational nature as his core of reflective concern, and the idea of loving him for it will no longer seem odd. So, 
if the basis of love is the value inherent in being an instance of a rational nature, and the object of love is one's personhood, understood in these same terms, what role is left for, one's, for the person's body in Velleman's picture of love? It is here that he makes an intriguing move. Velleman draws a distinction between one's personhood regarded as an instance of a rational nature and one's empirical persona. According to his Kantian view, everyone is equally worthy of love, just as everyone is equally worthy of respect, but not everyone is equally capable of giving a visible expression of this value. One's empirical persona, including one's gestures, tastes, sense of style, sense of humor, etc., uh, act, uh, acts as a, a conduit for expressing one's value as a rational nature. On the one hand, not everyone is capable of expressing this value equally well, and on the other, not everyone is equally adept at interpreting uh, this expression of value in others. This, according to Velleman, is what accounts uh, for the fact that we're able to love certain people rather than others, even though all are equally worthy of love. Uh, again, a rather long quote from Velleman here. One reason why we love some people rather than others is that we can see into, uh, we can see into only some of, the, our, some of our observable fellow creatures. The human body and human behavior are imperfect expressions of personhood. And we are imperfect interpreters. Hence, the value that makes someone eligible to be loved does not necessarily make him lovable in our eyes. Whether someone is lovable depends on how well his value as a person is expressed or symbolized for us by his empirical persona. Someone's persona may not speak very clearly of its value as a person or may not speak in ways that are clear to us. Now, there's something that I find appealing about Vellum's view. There's something I find crazy about it too, but there's something I find not, not crazy, but not convincing. Um, it, 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 one of the things I find appealing is that it connects the body and one's, uh, or one's empirical being in general to one's personhood uh, and implicitly to one's personality. But ultimately I find it dissatisfying as well as implausible. The main problem has to do with how one's empirical expressions of an inner value connect up with that value itself. Which of our expressions constitute an expression of our value as an instance of a rational nature? Why not all of our words and actions? Or are some of our words and actions outlaw, as Harry Frankfurt suggests, and not really part of the self? If the latter is the case, how are we to deter determine which are and which are not part of the self? The relation between one's empirical persona in general and one's personhood is unclear as Velman characterizes it. It is the separation of these two elements of personhood that I find problematic when attempting to identify love's object. Um, and I'll try to explain that. When, when I say I, I love Mary, when I say I love Mary, it sounds strange to say that what I mean is that I love some aspect of Mary, her personhood seen as, as an instance of a rational nature, as opposed to her smile, her intellect, her quick wit, and so on. On Velleman's view, these properties do not appear to be part of the true object of love, but only love's immediate object. Uh, again, to quote from Velleman, he says, the immediate object of love is the manifest person embodied in flesh and blood and accessible to the senses. Grasping someone's personhood intellectually may be enough to make us respect him, but unless we actually see a person in the human being confronting us, we, will, we won't be moved to love and we can see the person only by seeing him in or through his empirical persona. Now, what does he mean by the immediate object, object of love? In the context of the relation between one's empirical persona and one's personhood, as Velleman conceives of it, uh, it, he would seem to mean something like the apparent object of love in contrast with love's real object. But it is, ga but it is the gap between the two that I find hard to accept. The gap seems to reflect the influence of the Platonic Christian tradition that sees the body as an unworthy aspect of love's object. Uh, Velleman's view is perhaps an improvement on this since he does not degrade the human body in the way that Platonism and Christianity have at times, uh, but he does relegate it to a secondary and instrumental role in love. One's body, or more generally one's empirical persona, uh, becomes something like a means for expressing or revealing one's true self. I propose a different picture of love's object, uh, one that does not create a gap between one's empirical persona or one's body and, and what we might regard as one's true self. Uh, the notion of embodied personhood, of course, you know, a number of philosophers have uh, put forward a, a, a notion of embodied personhood or embodiment, um, and, I, and I 
list some in the footnotes. Uh, the notion of embodied personhood suggests that when the object of love is a person, what Velleman calls one's per empirical persona is part of that picture in a non-instrumental way. One's true self is not somehow hidden behind one's empirical qualities, uh, waiting to be expressed through them, but is rather constituted by one's qualities, um, including both mental and physical. This does not mean that one will love all of her or his beloved uh, qualities, but she will love him or her in virtue of certain qualities and in spite of certain other qualities. Um, but in saying this, I do not mean that it is simply a matter of the beloved's positive qualities outweighing her or his negative qualities. At times, Sobel speaks this way when discussing the distinction between the beloved's properties and the beloved as the object of love. Um, I will discuss Sobel's account in a later section, but for now, I will say that this represents a rather abstract way of talking about the beloved's qualities in the context of love. I claim that we love our beloved as a whole, and his or her qualities only make sense as part of that embodied whole. We do not love blonde hair or an expressive smile, but rather we love Mary's blonde hair or George's expressive smile. To say that we love a person's blonde hair only sounds wrong once we abstract that property from the person to whom it is a part. I think that this characterization is more true to the phenomenology of love. The problem appears to arise from the way that we speak about persons and their properties, uh, perhaps even from the structure of our grammar. We speak of one's arm, one's hair, or one's smile, much like we speak about the relation between oneself and objects that are external to one's body, one's coat or one's car or one's chair. We implicitly or explicitly make a distinction between our visible bodily properties and our inner conscious lives. The distinction is legitimate to the extent that it indicates two different sides of our experience, but becomes problematic once we hypostatize consciousness, reflectively or unreflectively, uh, and turn it into something substantially distinct from the body, a kind of person or self or something that inhabits us. Um, <clears throat> rather than uh, saying with Velleman that one's empirical persona is that which expresses one's true self, I want to say that in an important sense, one's persona is oneself. One's character and personality, which we often more closely associate with who one is, are important and perhaps defining aspects of our identities. Uh, but these are not qualities or sets of qualities that are somehow separate from the body or from our empirical persona in which they're expressed. Uh, one's, personality, one's personality only has reality as it, is, as it is expressed in one's sense of humor, gestures, sense of style, and so on. The idea of one's character means nothing apart from the visible actions and expressions in the world, even if this sometimes takes the form of refusing to act or being silent or being reserved. Even if one's consciousness or conscious thoughts are not directly accessible to another person, this does not mean that one's true self is somehow likewise concealed. Who one is, or one's identity, is not something hidden away, but something that exists out in the world for others to see and interpret. The perspective that others bring to understanding oneself is in many ways just as important as one's own first person picture. Other people, of course, often see sides of us, that there are aspects of us which we are in principle blind to. Of course, one may try to hide his or her intentions or desires from other people, uh, but even in this case, the deception or concealment is often revealed not by a first-person confession, but rather by the recognition of signs of the truth from the other person's perspective. If there is such a thing as one's true self, then this will be a self that is revealed in the world to and for others. There's a sense in which I know my own body or my own self as an embodied being by way of living my body, uh, but other people know me by perceiving my body and interpreting my words and actions. It is not clear that one perspective should have priority over the other when understanding the self. Uh, it is in this sense that the self is co-constituted or is a social self. In the following two sections, I'll discuss Parfit's view of the relation between love and personal identity, and will highlight some of the implications of it. Uh, my aim is to show why his account, his account is deficient in light of the view that I've just presented. Uh, in the penultimate section of the paper, I'll examine Sobel's view and will attempt to show uh, even though it entails a different problem, um, the view I present uh, serves as at least a partial corrective. <clears throat> so this next section, um, am I going too fast or is the pacing all right? Okay, good, thanks. Uh, this next section is called The Aim of Ordinary Love. <clears throat> 
Parfit's discussion of love in the section titled, Am I a Token or a Type, is a response to the Williams suggestion that what we love when we love a person is best characterized as a body, even if uh, Williams admits that this is a less than satisfactory characterization of, um, uh, of, the, of the issue. Williams makes his suggestion in his essay, Our Person's Bodies, uh, in, response to the lemma, in response to the dilemma posed by the hypothetical possibility of duplicating one's beloved. Uh, even, though, even though Williams, like Parfit, is primarily, primarily focused on the metaphysics of personal identity, what seems to motivate his claim that what we love when we love a person is a particular body is a concern about our ordinary view of love as well as perhaps love's phenomenology. Williams presents his example of Mary Smith, who in true sci-fi fashion um, has had several exact copies made of herself. In such a situation, if one were to love one of the copies, Williams suggests that it would be unclear whether what, what one loves was a token person or a type person. If we loved her despite the fact that she was a Mary Smith, we might love her as a token person. But if we loved her as a Mary Smith, then Williams suggests that we might love her as a type person. What is important here for my purposes is the reason behind Williams' suggestion that what we love when we love a person is a body. He tells us that the dilemma involved in determining whether we love a token person or type person threatens our ordinary conception of what it is to love a person. Uh, to quote from Williams, he says, much of what we call loving a person would begin to crack under this, and reflection on it may encourage us not to undervalue the deep, uh, deeply body-based situation we actually have. Now, what appears to motivate Williams to make this claim is not primarily his concern with the metaphysics of personal identity, but rather a view of what it is to love a person. He is concerned with the metaphysics of personal identity, but I think in this instance, um, he's more concerned with a kind of view of love, right, and, and the implications of uh, replication for this. Um, but this view of what it is to love a person, uh, of course, is deeply connected to our actual body-based situation. I believe that this is the point that Williams was trying to make, but I'm not sure that Parfit appreciated the extent to which this was a claim about the nature of love rather than the nature of personhood. More about this shortly. <clears throat> First, I want to look at a widely spread view of love which uh, Williams seems to adhere to and Parfit partly adheres to. Uh, what does such a view of love entail? Our ordinary view of love and its accompanying phenomenology suggests that love is aimed at a particular individual who is numerically one and this individual object of love is non-fungible or irreplaceable. Sobel, following Ronald D'Souza, suggests that irreplaceability is only part of our ideology of love. Of course, love arguably, of course, love is arguably constituted by both ideology and biology, so claiming that it's part of the former should not downplay its significance. But in, even assuming that non-fungibility is inessential to love, we're still faced with the claim that a particular love is focused on a particular individual, and if, that is, and if it is to remain the same love, then the beloved cannot be substituted for. But what constitutes substitution? This question might sound strange um, in normal conversations about love, but in the context of philosophical thought experiments, sci-fi examples, conceptually uh, possible advances in science and technology, a certain ambiguity arises. <clears throat> I call this situation ambiguous because when we normally think of the idea of fungibility in the context of love, we're thinking about the possibility of su substituting the beloved for another distinct person. Normally this takes the form of having feelings for or falling for a person other than one's beloved. But when Williams and Parfit talk about substituting the, substituting the beloved for an exact, exact replica um, of him or her, we're entering different territory. Is an exact replica a substitution for the beloved, or is it something quite different? This question appears to be what motivates Williams' distinction between type persons and token persons. Such a distinction could only be uh, applied to individuals, uh, individual persons qua individual if rec replication were a possibility. The, replica, the replicas in this case might be thought of as tokens of a type, although applying the notion of type to a particular in this way certainly stretches the meaning of the term as we normally understand it. 
Parfit disagrees with Williams' solution to the problem of duplication, focusing as it does on the token type distinction and suggesting that what we love is a body. He thinks that Williams' token type distinction might be useful in a world where many replicas of a single person coexisted, but, would not, but it would not be of any use in a world in which people are often replicated but only in one one form. So if there's several coexisting replicas of Mary Smith, you know, that, that token type distinction might play some role uh, and it might cause a problem for love and identity. Uh, but he doesn't think it will, he, Parfit didn't think it would in a case where uh, uh, Mary Smith was, was replicated, but her original, the original Mary Smith was destroyed, right? So there's still only one Mary Smith existing. <clears throat> uh, Parfit proposes that what we love is the mental life of our beloved, uh, which is in principle reproducible. This means that one's, the in principle here is, looms large as well. Um, this means that one's love for his beloved should transfer to an exact replica, since in the case of the replica, the mental life or psychological existence of the individual will continue. On Parfit's view, this presumably would not violate the contested non-fungibility requirement of love, since the substitution is such that nothing important to the identity of the beloved is lost. The replica is, in terms of qualitative identity, essentially the same person. Parfit's discussion raises an important issue concerning the relation between love and personal identity. His earlier claim in Reasons and Persons regarding what matters in personal identity, in other words, psychological connectedness and or continuity or relation are, uh, gives rise to a further claim about what matters in love. He claims that love, like personal identity, is concerned with the mental life of the beloved and not primarily with the body. Parfit thinks that his view is compatible with the ordinary view of love. Ordinary love, according to him, is, quote, concerned with the psychology of the person loved and with this person's continually changing mental life. In this regard, Parfit's view is not unique, but is rather an example of a fairly common characterization of love. Parfit thinks that an, an identical twin whose body is similar to the beloved will not provide an adequ adequate uh, object for the transference of love. In this case, the non-fungibility requirement of love has been violated since the mental life of the twin is different from that of the beloved, even if she looks physically the same. A replica of the beloved will, however, be a suitable object for the transference of love, since what one loves is the beloved's mental life, which contains her or his thoughts, memories, and so on. Presumably, since identity in the sense that matters transfers to the replica, then the non-fungibility requirement has been kept intact. But I think that Parfit's view on what matters in love, reliant as it is on his view of personal identity, is problematic. In fact, I think that it is his view of personal identity that leads him to mischaracterize the aim of ordinary love. What matters in identity, according to Parfit, is, and again, to quote from Parfit, relation R. Uh, and what he means by relation R is psychological connectedness and or continuity with the right kind of cause. Uh, it turns out the right kind of cause can be any cause, um, <clears throat> which will matter at some point here. Uh, since this is what matters for identity or for the survival of such, then Parfit concludes that this is what matters for love. But whether or not Parfit is correct about the metaphys metaphysics of personal identity, I believe that his claim about love's aim is incorrect. The idea that love's object is our mental lives as opposed to our physical bodies is not new. Um, as I suggested early, earlier, I mean, there's a, there's a tradition of this within Platonism and Christianity. You know, we get expressions of it uh, in, in Plato's Symposium uh, and so on. Uh, in the previous section, I discussed the Kantian version of this in Velleman's view of love. As we saw there, uh, Velleman's account, like Parfit's, separates love's object from the body, although perhaps in not in as, as extreme a way as, as uh, at least a, a couple of the views that are uh, expressed in, in uh, Plato's Symposium. <clears throat> the view of love suggested by Williams recognizes and is partly understood in terms of the deeply body-based situation we actually have, to put it in Williams' terms. It is this body-based situation that informs or shapes our common view of love. The situation we actually have is one in which there are no human replicas. Now, this might sound like a trivial truth in the context of a 
philosophical discussion of personal identity where thought experiments and conceptual possibilities can be informative. But when considering a view of love, this fact becomes vitally important. I believe that this is why Williams says that our ordinary view of loving a person would start to crumble in a situation where several copies of the same individual coexisted. Uh, the body-based situation that we, that we are in is one in which only a single instance of us exists, and when that is gone, so are we. Again, the purpose of highlighting this is not to deflate the thought experiments involved in repl involving replication by suggesting that they're unrealistic, but rather to show that whatever they might tell us about personal identity, they don't necessarily show us anything about love, or at least they don't show us the same thing about love. Right? Uh, Parfit thinks that the concern Williams expresses about love only applies to the imagined alternative to the actual world that entails multiple copies of an individual coexisting. Several Mary Smiths wandering around, right? Um, sorry, I lost my place here. Uh, a concern that he also thinks applies to some extent to one's conception of one's own identity. Parfit thought that, uh, you know, our own, that we might have some concerns or some threats to our own identity if there were several copies of us floating, you know, wandering around, right? Um, he admits that the branching case of replication may present a practical problem, a practical problem uh, for both personal identity and love. He does not think that this, this concern should apply to cases where a person has been replicated and her original body has been destroyed. Um, thinking of you know, the movie Solaris or the, the movie or the novel Solaris, for instance. Uh, but is this true? Does, does replication of the non-branching kind pose a problem for our concept of love? I think that it does for some of the same basic reasons that Williams thinks that the branching version of replication does. Okay, the next section is called Love and Replication. I'll try to move it along here. Uh, Williams thinks that our ordinary view of love for a person would be threatened by replication of the branching kind. This sort of replication threatens our concept of love because that concept is one that sees love as aimed at a particular and arguably unique individual. Uh, replicating an individual in a way that results in multiple co uh, coexisting instances of him or her threatens that uniqueness. But argu arguably, replication of the non-branching kind does not threaten uniqueness. On Parfit's view, when a person has been replicated and her or his old body has been destroyed, all that matters for personal survival still remains. <clears throat> the new body, which contains all of the memories and experiences of the original, is qualitatively the same as its predecessor. On his account, this simply amounts to an effective way to preserve one's youth, or in other cases, an efficient way to travel to other planets via teletransportation, okay, and to use some of Parfit's examples. Qualitative sameness is what matters for personal survival. Since this is so, Parfit thinks that this is also what matters for love. Speaking of the replicated, non-branching Mary Smith, he tells us, on the best conception of the best kind of love, I ought to love this individual. She is fully psychologically continuous with the Mary Smith I loved, and she has an exactly similar body. But it is here that I see the two concerns, um, what matters for identity and what matters for love, as coming apart. Even if Parfit's argument for why we should regard the situation as being as good as ordinary survival is convincing, it does not follow that his claim, I ought to love this individual, is so. One claim relies on a metaphysical view of personal identity whereas the other relies on a normative view about the structure and perhaps even the phenomenology of love. Uh, but what does such a view entail? Parfit characterizes his own view of love thus. Such love, and to quote from Parfit, such love is concerned with the psychology of the person loved and with this person's continual, continually changing mental life and loving someone is a process, not a fixed state. Mutual love involves a shared history. As a view of love, this is not bad, uh, but it's arguably overly focused on the mind. Uh, while, I, while I agree with Parfit that love is a process, involves a shared history, and is concerned with the mental life of the beloved, his thought experiments and sci-fi scenarios cause us to lose sight of the significance of what Williams calls our deeply body-based situation. On Williams' account, the significance of this is that, what is, is that it has shaped our current view of love. The object of our love is a person who is confined to a particular body with whom one also shares an actual history. This aspect of love is not significant. I do not think that William's view implies that the problem with replication is simply that it threatens the, the qualitative uniqueness of the love. 
I suspect that Williams would find even Parfit's altered Mary Smith scenario involving non-branching replication threatening to our ordinary view of love. Both scenarios ignore, to some extent, the deeply body-based situation we actually have. The body-based situation that we actually have is one that is limited or restrained by aging, mortality, uh, very limited forms of bodily replacements, uh, artificial limbs, and so on. Uh, the thought experiments and sci-fi scenarios that Parfit employs in his discussion may be useful in illustrating or highlighting issues relevant to personal identity, but arguably they mislead us when we turn to a discussion of what matters in love. Shannon, how much time do I have roughly left? I think it's going to 4.30 or something, is that what Okay, that's, that's good, yeah. I'm just gonna skip a little part because I think I can do without it, so. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on to the, the, the next section, uh, which is abstracting properties from persons. Uh, in his book titled The Structure of Love, Sobel gives a characterization of the relationship between persons and properties that I think raises similar questions to those raised by Parfit's view. Uh, to see what I take to be the problem with this view, the properties, properties view as I call it, I want to take a closer look at what Sobel says in the chapter titled The Object of Love. Whereas Parfit claimed uh, that love is directed at the experiences and memories of the beloved, Sobel's view of love's object involves more than the beloved's mental life. He sees love as involving the beloved's properties in general, which include bodily properties. As I mentioned in an earlier section, Sobel makes a crucial distinction between the ground of love and its object. The ground of love, according to Sobel, is a person's properties, but the object of love is the person herself. But what does he mean, what does he mean by person when he designates this as love's object? Uh, to quote Sobel, he says, the object of X's love is a collection of properties that Y is, yet none of these properties is necessarily also an object of love for X. Although he doesn't say it directly, Sobel implies that a person is to be understood as a collection of properties, right? This becomes what his object of love, what, it, what, it, what the person who's the object of love amounts to, right? <clears throat> but is such a view convincing as a characterization of the object of love? I do not think so for reasons that are to follow. Uh, before I give my reasons for questioning Sobel's account, I should re reiterate the fact that his, uh, his aim is different than Parfit's. Whereas Parfit was not primarily concerned with the theory of love or its object, but rather with, a, with an account of personal identity, Sobel can be characterized as being concerned with the opposite. He's concerned with the theory of the structure of love, and in particular, in the chapter in question, a view regarding love's object. His primary concern is not to present an account of personal identity. While I believe that there is a significant difference between identifying the object of personal love and establishing a set of criteria for personal identity, I think that the two concerns emerge in relation to each other in both the work of Parfit and Sobel. As I mentioned earlier, Parfit's view of what matters in love follows from his account of what matters in personal identity. There's a sense in, uh, in which for, for Sobel, a view of personal identity follows from, or at least is implied by, his account of love's object. But in both cases, I find their characterization of the object of love problematic. Uh, the common problem is the way that they characterize our experience of the beloved's properties. In his attempt to show that properties ground love and to help us understand the structure of love, Sobel tells us that X can love Y in virtue of Y's attractive properties that outweigh Y's defects. But this view of properties is surely an abstract one. Uh, it sounds as if we can assign a value to each property and add up the total number of attractive properties or the total overall, overall value of the attractive properties while subtracting the negative ones. Uh, but it seems to me that our experience of properties of persons is not like this. They do not easily admit of abstract representation because they are integrated into a body. In other words, they are embodied. I never experience the smile of my beloved in someone else, nor do I experience her sense of humor, her intelligence, and so on thus. I would argue that I do not even experience more objective or repeatable qualities such as hair color, height, eye color, etc., in another person precisely because I experience these qualities in a person primarily as a unity. Even though I may occasionally mistake someone else for my beloved when seen from a distance because her hair looks similar, my ordinary experience of my beloved's hair is as part of uh, her totality. She is not a loose bundle or collection of properties, perceptions, or whatnot, but rather the embodiment of these properties. I believe that Sobel's view fails to appreciate the embodied nature of our properties. 
It is only by viewing properties in abstraction uh, from the concrete person to whom they belong that one can suggest that since properties X, Y, and Z are repeatable qualities, the person who possesses these properties is fungible qua object of love. Even though Parfit's focus is more specifically on the mental properties of the, of the beloved, I believe that he makes a similar error. He sees one's mental life or mental properties, memories, thoughts, and so on, as constitutive of personhood. The various thought experiments and sci-fi scenarios that he presents isolate the mental life of a person from the rest of her being. Um, in other words, Parfit's account abstracts certain properties from the embodied person in a manner similar to Sobel. Similar but different. But but similar still. Uh, in so doing, I believe that Parfit presents an implausible account of what matters in love. I think that Parfit is mistaken in thinking both that the object of love is simply the mental life of the beloved and that these mental properties can be viewed in abstraction from the unity of the person or the embodied person. It is in this sense that I believe that his metaphysical view and the accompanying thought experiments that support it have misled him in his view of love and its object. His ontology of the person focusing as it does on specific kinds of properties, mental properties, uh, and the accompanying thought experiments and examples which he employs to convince us of his view, obscures the sense in which these properties are part of an embodied being with whom one has a real history and real memories. It is this embodied being with whom uh, we have a real history that constitutes the intentional focus of love. Parfit's claim that love aims at the mental life of the beloved, we must remember, is a response to Williams and his suggestion that to love a person is in some sense to love a body. Williams' own view in Our Person's Bodies uh, was on the right track, and I think that the notion of embodiment or embodied properties might have helped him develop his account in a more satisfactory way. Williams admits that, um, that saying... Uh, Sorry, Williams admits that saying that what we love is, uh, is a body, sorry, that we love a body is not quite right, but to move from this, uh, from this to claiming that we love a mind or a mental life, as Parfit does, is equally misleading. We do not court, flirt with, uh, or date, or fall in love with the mental lives or the collection of, a collection of properties. Uh, both of these are abstractions in the context of identifying love's object. Of course, the expression of the beloved's mental life is one of the things that attracts us and is an aspect of what we come to love. Uh, but it's not something that we love in isolation from the person's smile, sense of humor, sense of style, and so on. There is truth in the claim that we are our bodies, but to describe bodies and mental lives as competing candidates for love's object is surely misleading. We separate these two aspects or functions of our being in order to make sense of them, but we must not forget the artificiality of this separation. Recognizing that the body of the beloved is part of what we love is not simply a case of physical obsession, physical obsession with a body type. Parvit makes that suggestion at one point. Uh, but is rather to recognize that we experience the beloved as a unity. Uh, when, I say, when I say that we experience the beloved as a unity, I'm not simply making a claim about the nature of perception, but rather about love's intentional focus. It's only when I take an objectifying attitude that I begin to dissect that unity and analyze the discrete qualities of a person. Such analysis may prove useful in certain contexts and for particular, philosoph uh, for particular philosophical purposes, but these purposes are removed from the attitude and experience of love. In this sense, they are artificial and do not capture the phenom phenomenological experience of loving or the focus of that love. I think that it makes sense to say that one's beloved expresses her intelligence, humor, or creativity not only in words or full-fledged actions, but in a certain sense, perhaps partially, in her mischievous smile, her ironic frown, her playful glance, and so on. Uh, so love's object is neither best described simply as a body nor as a mind, but rather as an embodied person. What matters in love is the person experience as a unity and so described. The idea of embodiment is meant to characterize the person as a unity in this sense. One's mind or mental life is coextensive with one's body and is not to be thought of it uh, not to be thought of in isolation uh, as a true object of love. So, brief conclusion here. Hang on for just a few, a couple more minutes. Um, so the conclusion is called uh, Love's Focus. I mentioned early uh, in this paper that there exists an ambiguity concerning what is meant by love's object. Love's object may denote an entity in the world or it may refer to the way that we experience the person whom we love. Whereas in Parfit's discussion of love, it's clear that its object refers to some entity in the world. 
uh, Sobel's discussion retains the ambiguity. Uh, when the latter talks about the object of love, he refers to how the lover experiences the beloved as well as suggesting a view of the nature of the beloved as an object in the world. The lover loves a person and not properties in so Sobel's view. On the one hand, this suggests that he's referring to the intentional focus of love. But what the lover actually loves when we say that she or he loves a person is a collection of properties that the beloved is. This would seem to be referring to something like a metaphysical characterization of the person. The person whom one loves is a collection of properties. But it seems to me that love's intentional focus is concerned with an historical embodied human being. This means that not only is love not directed at specific properties, but it's also not directed at a collection of properties, even if these properties are the ground or part of the ground of love. Love is directed at an embodied human being with whom one shares a real history that includes real or normal historical causes, not just any, any cause, as Parfit suggests. Uh, likewise, replicas with whom one shares no actual history are inadequate substitutes for one's beloved. A replica can only be seen as an adequate substitute for one's beloved, it seems to me, if one accepts that the intentional focus of ordinary love is not restricted to our deeply body-based situation uh, where our actual shared histories, memories, uh, and causal histories matter. Thank you. <laughs>